My name is Lori Marino, and um, I had the distinct honor of uh, being interviewed in the film. Um, I've been studying dolphins and whales now for over 20 years. I'm a faculty member at Emory, and uh, I've studied dolphin and whale intelligence, as well as self-awareness, and had a chance to see killer whales in the wild, and um, can tell you it is really quite an experience. Growing up, I was obsessed with marine mammals and with primates, and I decided I either want to be an anthropologist or uh, uh, go and uh, learn about uh, marine mammals. And uh, as I got older, I realized I didn't really like the idea of captivity, but I realized that also we didn't have certain captivity to bring about awareness that, uh, that there was, you know, it was that somewhat necessity for that. So I, I kind of rationalized in my own mind that cap, or at least animals born in captivity, that that was kind of okay for the education of the public. Yeah. But they, they, that I realized, I was like, it's completely wrong to kidnap, steal animals from the wild and put them in places like such as SeaWorld and when I read about um, Tillicum, the Tillicum the Tillicum incident in uh, Outside Magazine a few years ago, um, that just kind of reinforced the idea. And then when the Georgia Aquarium came about, I was really excited about it. And when I heard about the whale sharks being put in there, I was infuriated. I was like, these, are, these animals aren't meant to, I mean, swim thousands and thousands in oceans you know, why? Right. And, then, and, then, and then I heard, and I, I might be incorrect with my numbers, but then I heard that some of them were dying, or had died. Yeah, they, they lost two of them. Yeah, and then there were, and they had beluga whales, and I heard that some of the beluga whales had died. And then, again, now I think they have a dolphin show where you can go and swim with the dolphins. And I have a friend who actually I did research with. I've worked on self-esteem authenticity. Yeah. And um, one of my friends had once swam with dolphins in Florida as a therapy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thank, thank you for your question. Um, I wanted to mention, you, you've got a lot of things in there that are really important. And um, the first thing is, yes, we did learn a lot about these animals uh, when we studied them in captivity. Um, I did work with captive dolphins for a number of years um, until I decided about 10 years ago to give it up because I didn't want to contribute to their suffering. Um, we did work on uh, mirror self-recognition in which we found that bottlenose dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors. And that really made me think, gosh, if they're that self-aware, what is their life like being in a concrete tank? Um, and at that time, they were housed in uh, the New York Aquarium in Coney Island. Um, so we learned a lot, but it's time to move on. Um, the really exciting stuff that's going on now in the science of studying marine mammals is going on in the field, in, in the wild. We're learning about the fact that they're cultural, they use tools, they have signature whistles. These animals are extraordinarily complex, and all of that is coming out of studies of animals in their natural habitat. There's hardly anything coming out of uh, captive facilities anymore. That's because most of the animals are dead. Um, they, they don't survive very well in captivity. Um, as to the issue of, well, you know, we need to find some way to be educated and appreciate these animals, um, it's really interesting because um, we've all been fed the line that, well, if we go to see these animals, we're going to come to appreciate them. And then when we leave, we're going to be more attuned to conservation and we're going to care more about them. And in fact, I've done a lot of work on this, researching the papers that claim, that make this claim. And there's no evidence for this. There's absolutely no evidence that if you go to visit a dolphin or a whale show, that you learn anything of 
any meaning or significance and certainly no attitude change. So that's a, that's a, a claim in search of evidence at this point. There's a question up there. Oh, well, that just sounds like a rationalization to keep these uh, really poor practices open. I mean, we do not, we recognize the pattern that these animals suffer. Uh, they're out of their environment. So what can we learn from watching animals, any human being, out of their environment? I mean, when you see creatures out of their environment, that doesn't increase your awareness. It only says it's really a very negative part of human behavior. And it just seems very clear that we need to move on. I, I agree with you. We, meet, we need to move on. Uh, as one of the trainers said in the film, he wouldn't want his child to learn the lesson that the way we treat other intelligent animals on this planet is by enslaving them, controlling them, and tormenting them. I mean, that's not a lesson I would want any child to, to, to learn. So yeah, it's time to move on. Yes? There was a portion of the film where they showed the whale getting an MRI. Yes. And, and some of the, could you tell us something about what was learned from that and what kind of implication that could have in terms of intelligence and, and emotional intelligence? Yes, actually that's a very good question because what happened was there was a killer whale that died at SeaWorld and I was able to get the brain through my connections. And I did with my colleagues the first magnetic resonance imaging study of orca brains. No one had really been able to do that because the brain is huge. So we took the brain, they took the brain out of the dead whale and we put the brain in an MRI, and what that allowed us to see, and you saw them up there, these sections, these 3D sections, allowed us to determine and measure precisely how big is this brain? How big are the different structures of the brain? What does it look like? How is it put together? And what we learned from that is that this is really a brain to be reckoned with. This is an enormously complex and a highly elaborated brain. And it's elaborated, and I, what I found, and my colleagues found, is it is elaborated in the areas that in all mammals are involved in higher cognition, emotional processing, and social cognition. The neocortex, the limbic system, and the paralimbic system. So does that prove anything? No, but it allows us to infer that if orca brains are mammal brains, and they are, then this is an animal with a lot of intelligence and a lot of social and emotional sophistication. In fact, I saw parts of their brain that were more elaborated than they are in the human brain. Yes. Yes. What was the significance of the collapsed dorsal fin? Oh, the collapsed dorsal fin. Well, the significance is this, is that because the tanks are so shallow that they don't really have anywhere to go, so they generally just sort of log on top, float on top, and over time the dorsal fin flops over in captivity because it doesn't have the support of the water. In the wild, killer whales spend a lot of time submerged and it's that amount of time submerged that allows the, the dorsal fin to remain up. And without that level of submersion, it just basically flaps over. Good question. Question there? Um, just out of curiosity, how many miles does like the average orca swim outside of captivity compared to inside captivity? Well, it uh, depends on the, the population. The question was, how many miles do orcas in the wild swim a day? They can swim over 100 miles a day. So when you realize that, it allows you to realize that there's no way that a, a tank, even the biggest tank in the world, which is at SeaWorld Orlando, that, that doesn't even come close to allowing them to exhibit these natural behaviors. 
Yes. Hi. Are there any differences in personality or aggression um, between the babies born in captivity versus those kidnapped? In, in oh, that is such a great question. Are there differences in the whales be, uh, depending upon whether they were caught in the wild or they were born in captivity? And the fact of the matter is, is that there, there doesn't seem to be all of the science tells us that the welfare of wild caught as well as captive born dolphins and whales is equally poor. They live, they still live the same short, stressful lives, die of the same diseases, show the same behavioral abnormalities. What that tells you is that there, it is a, captivity is fundamentally incompatible with what these animals need to thrive. And it doesn't matter if they're born in captivity, that doesn't make them domesticated. They're still wild. Yes? Um, how often do these institutions go out and hunt these animals? Well, what has happened is that there's, since the 1980s, there's been a general moratorium on hunting dolphins and whales for display um, from the wild. And that is sort of a deal a handshake agreement that the captivity industry made with the public because once the public saw these videos there was such an outcry that they just wouldn't stand for that happening anymore. Now it turns out that we have an institution in our own backyard, the Georgia Aquarium, which has decided after 20 years to break that deal with the public. They last year applied for a permit from the National Marine Fisheries Service to bring in 18 wild caught beluga whales. They've already caught them, caught and paid for them. And those 18 whales taken from their natural population off the coast of Russia are sitting in a pen off the coast of Russia. And the Georgia Aquarium, along with SeaWorld and Shedd Aquarium, have applied to bring them all the way over here from Russia uh, for captive display. And the reason is, is because the beluga whale captivity population is dwindling. They can't get them to survive. They can't get them, the babies to survive. So they're going and grabbing some from the wild. So that pact with the, with the public that the captivity industry made has been broken by SeaWorld, George Aquarium, and the Shedd Aquarium. Thank you. Yes? Um, is this captivity and being forced to entertain almost like comparable, comparable to a pit bull being forced to fight and being locked up in a cage and then released and showing all that aggression towards the other animal? Absolutely. I mean, this whole idea of, I mean, I don't want to get off on pit bulls, but you know, pit bulls are forced to fight. And when they are allowed to live a normal life, most of them turn out to be very loving, wonderful animals. Well, in this case as well, you're forcing the animals into such an artificial situation um, that there's really no way for them to thrive or lead a psychologically balanced life. It's just impossible. Are there any examples of uh, whales that have been in captivity that were released back in the wild and how they readapted? There are some examples of bottlenose dolphins that have been released after being in captivity for several years, and they've been successful releases. Um, Keiko, who was the whale that starred in the film Free Willy, was rehabilitated and then released. Um, and he lived for a while, but his health was so poor from his years of captivity that he didn't live very long in the wild. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, a lot of these animals are rehabilitatable and releasable, not all. So we shouldn't have the impression that they should all be dumped into the ocean tomorrow. We have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. What kind of diseases do they die from? What kind of diseases do these animals die from in captivity? Great question. I've done a, a tremendous amount of research on this. And what it shows is that they tend to die from diseases um, that have to do with stress. 
gastrointestinal ulcers, infections from immune systems being completely put down by the fact that they're in chronic stress. We know their stress hormone levels are high, and if you have chronic stress hormone levels high, that beats up your immune system, your immune system goes down, and then everything goes down. Um, so this is what we see. Um, we also see a lot of animals who are self-mutilating, um, who are aggressing against others, and literally just lose the will to live after a while. Um, so a lot of this is psychological, and it has to do with the chronic stress of captivity. It's a great question. Can you add something about your teeth onto that? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I don't know if you caught it, but if you saw some of Tillicum's teeth, they were very, very flat. And um, a couple of the trainers, John Jett and Jeff Venter in the film, just um, released a peer-reviewed scientific paper. Um, and what they showed is that these animals, um, one, are um, dying from diseases that have to do with mosquito bites from, from logging on the surface, but also that the teeth, the teeth are, for killer whales, are, are often very, very bad. What they do is they grate their teeth on the gate or on the wall or on a ledge, and they do this because it's a behavioral abnormality or they're trying to escape or they feel angry or frustrated. And so a lot of them have um, just broken teeth. And what they have to do then with these animals is they have to haul them out and drill their teeth. This is without anesthesia. They have to drill their teeth and flush them out several times a week because of how damaged their dentition is. Uh, so, a lot of people don't know that, um, but uh, if you ever get a chance to see a film like this, take a look at the teeth. It's very telling. What could we do um, about captivity? Where are you pointing at? Oh my gosh, that's the six million dollar question. What can we do about this? Well, I think the answer is, um, both simple and complex, but quite frankly, I mean, the answer is to just not support these kinds of facilities that make money from keeping these animals captive on display. Now, we might, you know, all here um, be aware of that in some sense, but what's important for you to do is to talk to people who may not know who may be on the fence, who may be considering taking their kids to SeaWorld on vacation in the summer, um, and not to force them not to go or to bombard them, but to just talk to them and say, hey, guess what I know? Did you know this? Here's some information. You know, make up your own mind, but are you sure this is a great idea? Um, the public has the power to stop this tomorrow by just not buying a ticket, and it's, we have to reach everyone in order for that to happen. Uh, this sort of thing, so we're just in levels of afraid that things will eventually happen, but as we have the Endangered Species Act, and when yes. I think about, sorry, I hate my foot. So, um, how is it that they can keep things like whale sharks and belugas in captivity, where it's very obvious, even in non-endangered species, that um, we're endangering them and they die. The endangered, the question is, how can we keep these animals in captivity when we have the Endangered Species Act? Well, no, you cannot keep animals who are endangered in captivity. But none, but orcas and bottlenose dolphins and belugas as a whole are not considered endangered. Now, there are certain populations that are endangered. Right, one of those is the southern resident population that you saw at the end of the film off of San Juan Island. 
That population has been so picked over by SeaWorld in the 80s that they have not fully recovered and they are endangered. Uh, so SeaWorld talks about how wonderful it is to have these animals in their protective care so that they, because they're endangered in the wild, when they are the ones that were major contributors to endangering that population. Okay, well, I guess we have to, we have to end things, but I really want to thank you for coming. Please tell people about this wonderful film. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you.